Hello everyone. I hope you had a wonderful spring break. This video begins week 12 of instruction for mass communication 100. This week we will be looking at the invention of broadcasting as a medium, specifically for radio. Now in week 10, we talked about popular music and the music industry. So this really focuses on the industry of radio and disseminating that music through broadcast production. Now, radio really began with Marconi, who was an Italian engineer working in the late 1800s. So in 1896, he received a patent for wireless telegraphy. And this was voiceless point-to-point -point communication, meaning you couldn't talk through it, but you were able to communicate between two points uh, in, across a certain distance. Now, for most of the period for this patent of, of this device that you see here, it was confined to Morse code and was primarily used for military and commercial ship communication. In 1901, Marconi, Marconi sent the first wireless signal across the Atlantic Ocean, making it a transatlantic form of communication. Now, Marconi, because of this invention, is often cited as the father of radio. However, the story of radio's history is not quite that simple. Let me introduce Mr. Tesla. Mr. Tesla actually invented a wireless system as well in 1892. He was a Serbian Croatian immigrant who came to the United States in 1884. And Marconi actually used a lot of Tesla's work within Marconi's telegraph. And so in 1943, the U.S. Supreme Court actually overturned Marconi's original patent for this technology and named Tesla the rightful inventor of radio. But that's not where the story ends either. You have to love history. Alexander Popov is a physics professor in Russia who developed wireless te telegraphy around the same time as Marconi and Tesla's work. However, Popov is an academic, not an entrepreneur, so he never filed for a patent. He did not own the invention that he created. And therefore, uh, while he had the ideas and the actual physics behind this invention, he's not credited for it because he didn't get the patent. So in Russia, they actually celebrate Radio Day on May 7th in honor of Popov's uh, contributions to the history of radio. So how did radio begin to expand? Well, one of the first people uh, interested in voice transmission, wireless uh, telephony, was Lee DeForest. He was the very first person to ever receive a PhD and write a dissertation on wireless technology. He developed what's known as the Audion Vacuum Tube. This device was able to detect and amplify radio signals, and this is what powered all radios until the 1950s. So this truly was the beginning of modern electronics as we know it. In 1901, however, he really had this rivalry with uh, Marconi. Both were working for reporter as reporters for rival news services. And one time they were covering an international yacht race in New York and their transmitter, their radio transmitter began jamming each other's signals and officials ended up having to relay with uh, flags and hand signals because these two were, were fighting. So really the early history of radio is filled with competition, uh, a lot of stealing and using of other people's ideas. So it's actually a very interesting history. Now, the first voice who was broadcast was Reginald Fessenden. He worked for the Navy and General Electric and also worked as Thomas Edison's chief chemist, so a very bright person. But on Christmas Eve, 1906 in Massachusetts, Reginald Fessenden played O Holy Night on his violin, becoming the first person to broadcast on radio professionally. He moved the wireless communication from point to point model, which is known as narrow casting, when you're just trying to communicate with a single other device, 
to a new one-to-many model, which is known as broadcasting, as we know radio now. Now, broadcasting was originally an agricultural term, but it's meant to suggest that you are broadcasting, sending your transmission signal from one point of communication across many, making it a form of mass communication. Now, in order to regulate radio, the government passed several acts that really shaped the history of what the radio industry would look like. In 1910, we get the Wireless Ship Act. This was an act that required all ships with 50 or more passengers that was traveling 200 plus miles offshore to have wireless equipment that could reach a 100 mile range. Now, this act was passed in 1910, which meant that when Titanic sank in 1912, they had wireless technology on board. In fact, uh, the picture on the bottom here is the um, radio room within the Titanic. They actually had Marconi's wireless equipment on board, but unfortunately, the signals just weren't strong enough to get help in time. Now, the Radio Act of 1912 uh, was partially supported and, and pushed through because of the Titanic sinking, and it required that anyone who was transmitting by radio signal would have to have a license. So it viewed frequencies as a natural resource, like national parks, meaning every single person should be able to benefit from transmission through radio, but only people who could prove that they were benefiting society uh, were given licenses by the Radio Act of 1912. So this is how we also adopted SOS as a formal distress signal, uh, which would go on to be used uh, throughout crisis communication. Of course, you know the term SOS. Now, uh, this Radio Act of 1912 is also how many American journalists who decided to work in radio thought of themselves as having to benefit society like public radio does now. And so you can see kind of the birth of that public focus movement because of the Radio Act of 1912. Now, during World War I, we began to see global fears and, and using radio as a way to inform Americans, but also protect Americans from outside influences. In 1917, the U.S. Navy closed down all amateur radio operations and took control of all transmitters for military security. So it really shifted radio from being something that could be used to communicate more broadly, and then it became an entirely military device in, uh, during World War I. And they wanted to make sure that American interests were served above global interest. In fact, uh, American, uh, particularly military forces, blocked the use of the British Marconi devices when building the transoceanic radio system because they wanted American inventions to be the one used. So in 1919, General Electric created a private sector monopoly known as Radio Corporation of America, or RCA. They, GE and RCA, pulled together over 2,000 patents that used radio technology and gave control to uh, RCA over this emerging mass medium. Now, Westinghouse engineer Frank Conrad was the first to broadcast music from a phonograph, and he actually delivered news to his friends beginning as early as 1916. So he was beginning to see the many uses that radio could have from music to journalism. And in 1920, he founded the very first commercial broadcast station, KDKA. In November 1920, Cox Harding uh, election returns were reported through the broadcast station, and this is really considered the very first professional radio broadcast because it was professional, it was informative, and it was really what we uh, consider good journalism today. In 1921, there were only five stations that were licensed, but just two years later, in 1923, we had over 600 
And part of this evolution of radio came because the actual radio device, the receiving device, became very popular within American households. By the end of 1923, 550,000 radios were sold. And the average cost of a radio at that time was $55. That's $701 today. So these were not cheap devices back then, but they were very popular. And by 1925, there were over 5.5 million radio sets in use across the United States. One of the major reasons for this becoming a heavily adopted technology, too, is that radio was smart. They thought about what the average homemaker wants, and they placed this big, bulky technology in very stylish and beautiful furniture. And so more and more people were willing to place it in their homes, and therefore it became an official mass medium for the country. Now, in 1922, we start... Uh, seeing the first true networks. AT&T claimed radio was a wireless telephone. And so they began using the technology almost like a wireless telephone. They started WEAF, which we now know as WNBC in New York. It was the first station to sell commercial time known as toll broadcasting. They were able to connect stations in New York and Boston via telephone wires to form the first ever network. They shared programming that was produced in one location across these two cities. And so that's how we get the idea of broadcast networks that we use not only for uh, radio, but also for television. Now, in the early 20s, there really was a race to control radio in terms of ownership of the technology. Uh, AT&T tried to take over radio by connecting 22 different stations across the U.S., and there really began this rivalry between the telephone group, AT&T, and the owners of the radio groups, which were GE, Westinghouse, and RCA. Now, the radio group was having to use inferior uh, technology, these telegraph lines from Western Union, because AT&T was refusing to give them access to their phone lines for their radio operations. So in 1925, they came to a resolution. AT&T sold the telephone group to RCA, but they were able to gain a monopoly on long lines, wires that connect stations nationwide. So they got a lot of business by making this, this agreement with RCA. Now, it meant that AT&T was banned from re-entering broadcasting as an industry for eight years, but actually AT&T didn't end up entering broadcasting until the 1990s with the internet and other broadcasting technologies. Now, the first network was NBC. In September of 1926, David Sarnoff, who was then an RCA executive, created the National Broadcasting Company. What was happening was you had a lot of these small stations who were independent of any real owners. They just had their license and they produced programming. These independent stations would pay NBC to become affiliates nationally. They received NBC programming, they received news wires, and all the benefits of being owned by a network. Sarnoff really envisioned radio as a mass medium early on. He was working with Marconi at the age of 15 and became an RCA executive at the age of 30. And so he really wanted to de-emphasize local and regional content in favor of these national broadcast programs that would connect the entire nation and really have them listen to just one type of programming. And this was really cemented by a historical event in 1927, Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator, became the first person to make a transatlantic flight. And NBC broadcast coverage of this transatlantic flight. They had 25 to 30 million listeners on 6 million radio sets that were being used at the time. It was the largest shared audience experience in this time period. And so it really cemented NBC as one of the true networks and the network style of national programming as the future of radio. Now, 
Here's some of the radio coverage from Charles Lindbergh's flight. 52, the spirit of St. Louis. Oops, sorry about that. 52, the spirit of St. Louis began to roll down the muddy runway. Would it get off the ground or would it crash at the end of the runway? Twice its wheels left the ground only to return. And then the plane was airborne. It was 7.54 Eastern Daylight Time. So you can tell that uh, the radio listeners, of course, would not have the visuals that you're seeing, but it was something that people across the nation really wanted to listen to and feel invested in. And NBC and the technology of radio allowed them to do that. Now, a rival station was created in 1927, the Columbia Broadcasting System, what we better know as CBS. Now, CBS was bought by William Paley in 1928, and Paley originally bought the network to promote his family's cigar company. He figured if he owned a network, he could advertise on it more. He anticipated only running the network for six months, and then he was going to sell it so that um, you know, he would have six months of advertising, but Paley ended up running CBS for over 40 or over 50 years. So he really fell in love with the network and, and its ownership of it. Now, CBS created what's known as option time. They would pay affiliates, the little independent station, $50 per hour and provide them with programs in order for the network at the national level to sell ad space and sponsorships of programs. So in 1933, CBS owned over 90 affiliates. CBS actually stole many of NBC's affiliates and major talent as well, uh, really making it one of the largest and highest respected networks in radio at the time. Now, during World War II, Edward R. Murrow, who was one of the uh, most famous journalists in our country, reported from London on CBS radio, and it really established CBS as the premier news radio network. So if you were listening to news on the radio during this time period, you were likely listening to CBS because it was the highest rated network uh, in 1949. Here's a little bit of some of Edward R. Murrow's reporting. Again, these images would not have appeared with it. We are only really listening for the sound. This is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid siren. I'm standing here just on the steps of St. Martin's in the Fields. Searchlight just burst into action off in the distance. One single beam sweeping the sky above me now. People are walking along quite quietly. We're just at the entrance of an air raid shelter here, and I must move this cable over just a bit so people can walk in. So you can imagine that during this time period when many Americans had never even been to London and were watching the terrifying images and uh, sounds coming from World War II, that radio provided them a sense of comfort and information that they were desiring at that period of time. It really helped the nation feel connected to the war and to stay informed about what was going on. Now, you may remember in our previous discussion about regulating radio that the Radio Act of 1912 gave the Commerce Department the right to issue licenses. Unfortunately, the Commerce Department really didn't have any power to deny them. They were the ones who issued them, but it was very hard to deny someone an actual license. And so what happened was the airwaves started getting clogged because you had so many people who were broadcasting through radio. By 1927, sales in radio were declining because the airwaves were just completely clogged with transmission and you weren't really able to get a good signal. So we get the Radio Act of 1927. This is where licensees did not own their actual channels. So you could only be licensed as long as you were willing to serve the public interest, convenience, or necessity. And this Radio Act of 1927 actually created the Federal Radio Commission, 
the FRC, which was very important at the time. And uh, even today, uh, we'll, we'll learn here in a minute that the FRC becomes the FCC. But even today, uh, radio hosts still need to get their F FCC uh, license. This is from a good friend of mine who works for NPR, and um, this is her radio license from the 90s. Now, the Communication Act of 1934 was extremely important in terms of regulating radio. The FRC became the FCC, or Federal Communications Commission, at this time. The FCC actually outlawed CBS's option time, meaning that a network could not pay a local affiliate to uh, host their programming. They also forced RCA to sell part of their NBC network because they had become too large of a monopoly. Those stations that RCA sold out of NBC became the American Broadcasting Company, what we now know as ABC. Now, what did programming look like on early radio? Well, evening programs were about 15 minutes long. So some of the most famous programs and most popular were Amos and Andy, The Lone Ranger, The Shadow, and The Green Hornet. In 1925, Amos and Andy was the most popular radio series ever uh, in the history of radio. By 1930, in one season, it had aired on over half of all radios in the United States. So that shows you the broad reach of a single show. It launched the idea of a successful serial show where you have uh, one storyline that continues over a period of weeks, and that became the format for radio programming, uh, both in entertainment and then later for television. Popular types of shows were comedies, sitcoms, variety shows, quiz shows, and soap operas. These may sound familiar. They're also what are the popular formats for a television broadcast. So they really got their start in radio. The first soap actually aired in 1931. It was called Clara, uh, Lou, and M. And by 1940, there were over 60 soap opera shows that took up 80 hours of radio programming in the week. So soap operas were very, very popular. As you can imagine, many women were still working in the home at that time, didn't have um, real jobs at that point. And so they, the soap operas were really uh, marketed specifically for those women at home. Typically, these programs are sponsored, which meant that it was how advertising quickly became a part of the radio and broadcast industry. So for example, Amos and Andy uh, was sponsored by a soap company. And although those two things don't have anything in common, the Amos and Andy show was always presented by a certain company. Now, uh, FDR uh, had famous fireside chats, which uh, were popular aspects of radio programming. FDR was the very first president to ever use broadcasting technology to communicate with citizens, and they became a very important part of presidential and political communication. Here's an example of one. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking, but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. So the president would address the nation about various topics in the FDR fireside chats, and they really became the format for how presidents were expected to communicate with every citizen and really have a national dialogue. Another important program in radio history is War of the Worlds. On Halloween Eve of 1938, Orson Welles uh, produced a program called War of the Worlds. It was presented as a... Um, news clip, although there was a short um, warning at the beginning that this was a fictional episode about to play. Apparently it didn't play at the correct time or, or something. And many people did not hear that early warning and weren't aware that this wasn't an actual news bulletin. What's the problem? Well, 
the news bulletin makes it seem like Martians are attacking the world. And so apparently there were millions of people who were convinced, if only briefly, that the United States was being laid waste by alien invaders. That is what our history books have told us for years and years and years. But in reality, historians have found that the panic was very, very tiny so small, in fact, that it's not even measurable how many people would have actually listened to War of the Worlds. It was actually scheduled against the most popular national program at the time, meaning it had very few listeners in its original broadcast. So where did this idea of the panic caused by War of the Worlds come from? Newspapers. Newspapers were being taken over by news radio. They were feeling threatened by the fact that uh, radio broadcasters could reach more people. It was uh, the more popular technology at the time. And so newspapers seized the opportunity presented by Wells's program to discredit radio and try to gain back control over news. And so that's really... Um, what historians have found to actually be the maker of the myth behind the panic of War of the Worlds. So War of the Worlds is still a very important part of history, but not because of the reasons that we th would typically think. Here is uh, some of the original broadcast of that. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> So you can hear the warning that they provided, but you might not know it's fiction at that point. Columbia Broadcasting System. For one of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. It's my guess that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. That is my conjecture of the origin of the heat ray. So you could Thank imagine... You, Ladies and gentlemen, here is a bulletin from Trenton. It is a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in a Trenton hospital. So you can imagine how if you had tuned in just a little late or, you know, you, you weren't really listening, that that sounds like a news bulletin. And you can understand why there might have been some people confused, but apparently the panic created by War of the Worlds is not as broad as we really think it is. Now, radio became um, uh, an important part of American culture, primarily because it became one of the first technologies to be used on the go. By 1947, Bell Laboratories had created the transist transistor radio. These were small devices that receive and amplify radio signals. And in 1953, Texas Instruments, you know, the people that sell your calculators, marketed the first transistor radios for $40. By 1957, we had Sony pocket radios, radios that were small enough to fit in a shirt pocket. And by 1960s, the transistor radios were cheaper to make and produce than tube and battery radio radios. The key was that they were easily portable, which meant by the 1960s, most radio listening happened outside of the home. Now, there's also an interesting historical battle in the types of signals that we receive. You may be familiar with AM radio and FM radio. Well, Edwin Armstrong discovered and developed FM radio, which is frequency modulation in the 1920s. And in fact, um, Sarnoff, who was the RCA exec, set up the first experimental FM station on, Empire, on the Empire State Building. Now, FM was ideal because it offered more clarity and static-free reception than AM radio did, which was primarily produced for talk radio. 
But by 1935, Sarnoff wanted to focus RCA on t- TV and protect their AM empire. So he refused to allow Armstrong to use or, um, or radio stations to develop technologies that would utilize FM radio. And uh, the FCC moved FM to a new band. This made pre-World War II radios useless. And unfortunately, because of all of these barriers to his technology, which he believed was better and superior, Armstrong actually committed suicide in 1954. Now, by the 1960s, the FCC opened up space for FM, which really brought new life back into radio and made it less focused on talk and more focused on music. Now, what you need to know about AM and FM signals is that AM stands for amplitude modulation, while FM uh, stands for frequency modulation. So um, these are different types of technologies. I won't make you memorize what they are, just know what they stand for. AM stations have further reach because they are using amplitude models, which allow the sound wave to be longer, but FM has better quality because it's using frequency modes of sound. And so um, by the 1980s, FM stations were much more profitable and AM stations started to slowly die off. Currently, there are over 10,000 FM stations. Now, in 1949, Todd Storrs toyed with format radio, which allowed management to pick songs instead of disc jockeys just being the one to pick whatever they liked. This was developed because they were watching how people used jukeboxes in public places, and they noticed that uh, people were playing the same songs, the most popular songs, and they wanted to take advantage of that listening. So they created what's called rotation, where they play the same top songs several times a day to get people to listen to the songs that they really like. By the mid fifties, format radio and rock and roll led to the top 40 format that is popularized in radio today. Now you may have always wondered why it's the top 40. It's because 40 is the number of records that are stored in a jukebox. So the top 40 were the 40 records um, that were played most often in jukebox. Today, top 40 mainly refers to the 40 most popular songs based on record sales. So by the 1960s, managers were asking DJs to talk over the beginning and ending of songs to prevent station switching, which really popularized a lot of local disc jockeys. Um, There are also certain parts of the day that disc jockeys and radio was most popular. Um, So a show would run from 6 to 10 a.m. and then 10 to 3, 3 to 7, and 7 to midnight. Uh, the most popular really being the six to 10 slot. And then that three to seven slot, those are the heaviest listening times, primarily due to drive times. So uh, the most popular DJs will tend to work really early in the morning. And then that three to seven shift at night. Now it is important to note that due to COVID-19 and remote working schedules, the radio industry has uh, taken a particular hurt because there is a lack of driving involved for people's schedules, which means people are not tuning into the radio nearly as frequently as they once did. We'll have to see how that impacts the industry overall. So now that you understand a little bit more about the history of radio and broadcast, I want you to watch the second video, part two, which will cover the industry and current social issues. Then go into your discussion board and talk about podcasting's impact. Then you can prepare for next week by reading chapter six on TV and cable.